Okay, now in the second part, let me just give you some examples of the way that we are going to use GIS. This is by no means an exhaustive list. This is just to get your brain focused and start to make you understand what it is we're going to be studying this entire semester. So first off, I want to talk about why do we offer this class and why do we make a lot of our students take it, specifically our wildlife and our fishery students need to take this. This is becoming a standard tool for ecologists. I always say to people that when I started teaching this class, if you had some GIS background, that would put your resume to the top of the pile. Now, if you don't have any GIS experience, you probably don't even get in the pile. Um, maybe you won't be using this directly every day, but you are going to be working with GIS or with people who are working with GIS and you're going to be using the GIS products if you're going to be an ecologist. So it's important that you have some idea of what you're talking about. That's why we have this class. Um, and so again, if you're trying to find employment, we want you to have some GIS experience. Now, this class, or the GIS, is typically based in geosciences, geography, or geography departments, right? Which makes perfect sense because that's what they do and they do it very well, right? It's all mapping, it's all spatial analysis. That is their forte and they do a very good job of it. So why do we have my class in biology? Simply because we use the software in a slightly different way. We emphasize certain types of data over other types. And I wanted to give an opportunity for biologists to learn it from another biologist. And so that's really the only reason that um, we have this particular class. But most of the classes will be taken in geography or geosciences, which is the way it should be. Like I said, the only thing is, is they don't concentrate on techniques important to biologists and they don't discuss papers written by biologists and ecologists. And so this is just from a biology ecology point of view. Okay, so let me give you some examples of what we can do with the GIS. We can make simple maps. And so, for example, you could say, hey, show me all the cities with a population greater than 50,000. That's a simple map, right? We can look at spatial relationships. So we could ask, um, hey, we've got a layer of wood duck nests and we've got a layer of rivers, right? So we could say, hey, how many nests are within, you know, 100 meters of a stream or 500 meters of a stream or what's the average distance to a stream or maybe we have a layer of habitat and we could ask, uh, you know, what's the average distance to the nearest wetland for a wood duck nest. Spatial relationships. We can take several layers and combine them to make a new map. And so we can look at the relationship between these layers in this new map. So for example, you could look at like, you know, rainfall and temperature, slope, soil type, sunlight, whatever you have layers on, and you could combine them and then let's say that you had a plant and you knew the specific requirements it had for rainfall and temperature and soil and slope and sunlight. And so you could have the software tell me, okay, where should I put this plant or where should I look for this plant based upon those parameters? You can make physical maps, maps of a physical area. So just as an example here, this is a, an old aerial photo of where the uh, Missouri River runs into the Mississippi, just upstream from St. Louis, a place we used to sample for sturgeon. And we often have sampling sites and we often want to have a map of those sampling sites to show people. Very simple. Um, we have a shape file that represents the river and so we can show where the river is and we can show where our sampling areas are on that river and we often need those sort of things if we're giving a talk or doing a report or we want to communicate to someone where it is we're sampling. Instead of just giving them coordinates, it's much better to give them a map. That's a simple physical map that we created. 
Here's a map of elevation. I showed you this one before. This is just simply taking a raster and we have the, for each cell in the raster, we have the elevation. When we colorize based upon those, we can start to see uh, details arise. And we can see, like for example, here you can see clearly we've got two streams running from the northeast down to the southwest. Here's an example of another physical map that we do. Watershed. If you've got a stream or a lake or a reservoir and you want to know what, where it gets its water from, the software will do that for you. So if you look in the bottom here, this is a lake uh, called Spring Lake that I used to work on. And then using the elevation of the surrounding area, the software can draw and delineate the watershed. So now we know that any drop of rain that falls anywhere in this watershed eventually is going to, can work its way into the lake. And so then when we combine that with something like land use, we can talk about what kind of land use do we have in the watershed and how is that affecting water quality, for example. Here's another type of physical map that the software will do simply called slope, again using elevation. Uh, it can tell you how steep or how flat an area is. And so sometimes the actual elevation is not important, but the change in elevation, which is slope. Similar thing from the same data, we can also talk about aspect, which is at any point, what direction is it facing? And so if it tend, you know, areas that tend to face toward the south get more sunlight, toward the north get less sunlight, or maybe they face into or away from the prevailing winds, you can get that from the software. Here's something uh, called view shed. Again, if you've got the elevation, you pick a point, it will tell you if you're standing at this height at this point, you know, what can you see and what can you not see? These are all just examples of things the software can do. We can create bathymetry, which is the lake depth. And so here's a map of a uh, Argyle Lake, like I used to work on. And we go out and measure depth at a bunch of places. And then we have it create a map that uh, gives us the depth and for example what we were doing is we were going out every five years and repeating those measurements and then we can take those different maps and compare them and we can make a new map showing where sediment is filling in the lake and where the shoreline is eroding and things like that. Um, this is a technique that we're going to work on later something called an interpolated raster. So again this is a raster, it's a grid of cells and we can't go out and measure depth at every place in the lake, right? That's just impossible. But we can measure in a lot of places. And so we can have the location and the depth for many spots within this lake, but then the software can interpolate or fill in between those spots. So if you've got a grid of cells and the numbers you see here for example, could be the depths that I measured at each of those spots. But then the empty cells are areas we did not measure. But using particular, you know, the al algorithms that are built into the software, it can fill in those gaps with kind of our best guess at what's in between those. And so by taking just a few measurements, you can create a nice smooth map based upon those few measurements. That's called interpolation. That's another thing that we're going to be doing with the software. Of course, if you've got a bathymetry map, many of you might be familiar with a contour map, and you can create contour maps based upon that bathymetric raster. Once you have the data, you can uh, extrude it into a 3D shape. And so uh, this is a very rough 3D shape of the river bottom somewhere, but once you have that 3D shape in your computer. You can grab it and twist it around, which is pretty cool. But nowadays you can take that 3D shape, you can export it to a 3D printer, and you can print out an actual scale model of whatever it is you're measuring. In this case, you know, the river bottom. Another cool thing that you can do, you've got this 3D shape, then you can drape data over top of it. So for example, here I've got kind of a 3D model of the river bottom, and I also measured water velocity at the river bottom. And so then I could drape 
that water velocity over top of the 3D model and you can see where you know the red areas where the water velocity is very high versus how that relates to the shape of the bottom. These are just examples of things you can do. So those are all physical maps, maps of habitat or area. But of course we can also throw in some living creatures and do biological maps. So here's an example of a physical map which is a portion of the Mississippi River and it's been broken into different macro habitats such as the main channel or wing dikes or side channels or the uh, channel border you know, large areas of the river that are a different type of habitat based upon depth or velocity. And then we also have a point shape file, which are locations of tagged sturgeon. And so we go out, we can locate the sturgeon and we can collect their location, have the software put those two together, and then we can look at how much habitat's available versus how much the fish are using, are they clustering in certain areas, how far away are they from certain other types of habitats. We can do all kinds of analysis of these uh, tagged individuals in relation to their habitat. And so again, we can talk about what habitats are available, which ones did they use, And we can have the software summarize things and so we can get a very accurate estimation of how much of each habitat is there and of course we can summarize how many fish were located in each one and we can look at use versus availability in a number of different ways. And here's a list of lots of other things that you can do. We have a lot of things we can do with tagged organisms. It's, it's one of the neatest ways we can use this software. So you can look at home range for organisms. You can look at daily movement. When do they move more? Do they tend to move in one direction at one point in the day? Um, spatial distribution and correlation. So you can bring in all kinds of other layers like slope or land use or dis you know you could you could have a uh, tagged mammals like moose or something and you could look at how they relate to roads and are you know do they seem to avoid roads or or do they not care you know, if you're going to go sampling you can create random sampling sites so that you uh, don't have any bias and you just go out to those sites to take your samples do things like a random walk, like if an organism was walking at random, what would it look like and how does that compare to what it actually did? Are these organisms, are they walking around at random or do they seem to be, you know, have a direction? Things like shortest route or least cost path. Um, so, you know, if an organism has to get from A to B, will they walk in a straight line or will they take a more circuitous path because it's actually easier based upon the cover and the slope and other things that are important to that organism. Uh, organism habitat prediction, uh, you know, based upon all these different factors, where can we go looking for these particular organisms? And just lots more. This is just some ideas, but you, you get the point here. There's lots and lots of ways we can use this software in ecology. And that's why I think it's important that you have it. That's why we want you to take a class like this. Okay, so please uh, read chapter one in your book. It goes over some of the same things. It gives different examples. You know, hopefully once you get through there, you'll have a real good idea of what we're getting into. And that's all I have for right now. Um, so great. I'll see you later. And thanks for listening.